Father, we thank you. We come before you. We pray that you would open your word to our hearts this evening. As John remembers, looking back, the things that he had seen and heard that he wanted to make sure we would hear and perhaps see as well. You are the Christ. You are the Son of God. There is no other name, we learn in Acts chapter 4, given among men, whereby we must be saved, but Jesus of Nazareth. Because there is no one else in human history who has been God in human flesh. And so, Lord, may our hearts open this evening to the Gospel of John, truly a wonderful gift to the church. May we have hearts to understand. We ask it in Jesus' name. Amen. Well, Nathaniel heard about Jesus in chapter 1, verse 46, and he said, Could any good thing come out of Nazareth? And Philip saith unto him, Come and see. And we went through all those different words, five, I believe, of them or so, that we had for seeing, Ido and Horeo and Blepo and um, Theomai and Optonomai and all those great things we went through. But come and see. And Jesus saw Nathanael coming to him, verse 47, chapter 1, and saith of him, Behold, an Israelite indeed, in whom is no guile. And Nathanael saith unto him, Whence knowest thou me? Jesus answered and said unto him, Before that Philip called thee, when thou wast under the fig tree, I saw thee. And Nathanael answered and said unto him, or saith unto him, Rabbi, thou art the Son of God, thou art the King of Israel. And Jesus answereth and say unto him, Because I said unto thee, I saw thee under the fig tree, believest thou? Thou shalt, here's our word, aptonomai, or aptonomai, see and really get it. Thou shalt see greater things than these. And he saith unto him, Verily, verily, I say unto you, Hereafter you shall see, again that word, heaven opened. And the angels of God ascending and descending upon the Son of Man. And again, the title of the one who comes to the Ancient of Days in Daniel's vision in chapter 7, who's given a, rule, a rod to rule all nations, and his dominion will have no end. So Jesus is saying, essentially, in their vernacular, he is the Son of God. He is the one who comes to the Ancient of Days, and heaven is going to open and ascend and descend upon him. So chapter 2. And the third day, there was a marriage in Cana of Galilee. Now, if you turn to chapter 21, verse 2, you don't have to because I'm going to spoil it for you anyway. But Cana is the town where Nathanael is from. So they are headed back to Cana in Galilee. There's a wedding. He's invited. The third day, there was a marriage in Cana of Galilee. And the mother of Jesus was there. Now, some traditions argue, Edersheim and others, say that virgins were married on Wednesdays, widows would get married on Thursdays. Can we prove it? Don't know. We'll find out when we get to heaven, but just in case you're studying through, that's at least one tradition that is out there. But it was the third day, there was a marriage in Cana of Galilee, and the mother of Jesus was there. And both Jesus was called and his disciples to the marriage. And when they wanted wine, the mother of Jesus saith unto them, they have no wine. Cana, like every, most other towns at this time, are really villages, hamlets, small areas. You know, we, we think of, you know, large cities or even townships here, we've got thousands upon thousands, and these are much smaller. So generally speaking, most people know folks in those towns. Populations aren't very big. We look at these things. We look at Nazareth and elsewise, the time that Christ went into the synagogue in uh, Nazareth there. But they're, they're a smaller pop population. And you might say, well, what's, what's the big deal? If you have a social, like, oops, it's a big deal. And one big deal is having a wedding feast, which generally lasts for seven days. So imagine inviting a good part of the town or wherever the case may be, and you've got to basically feed them and give them drink for seven days. Think about it. Yeah, anybody do a Super Bowl party? And like they just come in, it's like they're like locusts. Just, and they leave, and there's just bowls of chips left open and all that. And, well, for seven days, you've got the, the, whoever in the community you've invited, and they are your guests. 
And so to run out of food or to run out of wine, for example, means that you have failed to plan properly. And so it is, it is a breach of hospitality because you've invited them to be your guests. And it's in many ways kind of a stain against you as a family that you weren't able to meet the needs of the people you've invited. And, and so there's a lot attached to this socially. And when you're in a smaller town, village, or hamlet, to then be like, well, there are the people who can't get enough wine. It can actually cause you trouble within the community. So you might not think that's a big deal, but here they're at this wedding. They're in Cana of Galilee, and the people are there, and Jesus gets called with his disciples, and they wanted wine. They ran out. It's not like they had the party for a few days and said, say, I know, let's have some wine. They've run out of wine is the idea. How long do these last? Seven days. Bonus question. How many weeks are left to finish the transgression, to make an end of sin, to make reconciliation for iniquity, to bring in everlasting righteousness, to seal a vision and prophecy, and to anoint the most holy. How many sevens are left? How many weeks? One. Daniel's 70 weeks. 69 of those sevens have occurred, and the fulfillment of that ultimately was when Messiah the Prince comes to Jerusalem. He will be cut off, but not for himself. If you know your Bible, you know the answer. He died for our sins. He paid for our transgressions. He rose again the third day. There is only one final week of prophecy that has to unfold. And in Daniel chapter 9, verse 26, and then into verse 27, that 70th final week of human self-government in history will kick off with a world leader who rises up and creates a peace agreement or he confirms a covenant with many for one week. And as you know, in the midst of the week, he's going to cut off offering and sacrifice and he's going to demand, as we know from other scriptures, to be worshipped as God in the temple of God. And we'll talk about that word in a few minutes as we work through what goes on here in chapter 2. How long is that last period of time? One week. How long is a marriage? Wedding is one week. Another reason why it is my heartfelt conviction the church will be removed at the beginning of that seven year period because we are going to the marriage feast of the lamb. And how long do marriage feasts generally last? One week. Seven days for us the final seven years. You see, he has to gather his church, welcome them. We enter into the, his, his presence and the Father's presence. We're owned as his own. And somewhere in the course of that time, he's going to reward his church for the things that they've done. Our salvation was handled on the cross. When you trusted in Jesus Christ, your sins were forgiven. He said, it is finished, not now it's your turn. It is finished. But he's going to reward, as you know from 1 Corinthians 3, he is going to reward the church for the things that we have done with the truth that God so loved this world that he gave his only begotten son that whomsoever would believe upon him shall not perish but receive everlasting life. God has put that treasure into these earthen vessels that you know that Jesus has come, died, and risen again according to the scriptures, that he is the only one in human history who can fulfill these scriptures, and if, there, if anyone can be the savior of the world, it is him and him alone. And you hold that truth. And if you'll open your heart to Christ, he'll satisfy. He'll fill your heart. He'll change you from the inside out. God wants to reward us with what have we done with that treasure, that good news. And so... Here we are, they're at this wedding, they get there, they wanted wine, and verse 3, the mother of Jesus saith unto him, they have no wine. Why would she say this? Is it like, oh, they have no wine, look at that. Why would she say it? She expects what? She expects him to do something. And then, of course, tone and intonation, we have to wait until we get there, but was it, they have no wine. You know, I mean, this is, this is a problem. They have no wine. And Jesus saith unto her, woman, not mother, gune in the Greek, woman. Woman, what have I to do with thee? A lot of people read this and they go, what's going on here? Well, let's dissect it from it. Not mother, but woman. That speaks of distance, right? Woman. What have I? I is interesting because normally it would be moi in the Greek, I, me, my, or mine. But it's actually emphatic, emoi. What have I to do with thee? And then we get this hint. Mine hour has not yet come. 
How many know there are three other gospels? What are they? Great. When was this one written? Okay, so let's go back. Turn to Luke chapter 1. Why is she saying this? What does she expect? So let's go back to what has been told to Mary thus far about some of these things. In Luke chapter 1, of course, in the sixth month, the angel Gabriel was sent from God to a city of Galilee named Nazareth to a virgin who's espoused to a man whose name was Joseph, verse 27, Luke 1, of the house of David, and the virgin's name was Mary. And the angel came in to her and said, Hail, thou that art highly favored, the Lord has, is with thee. Blessed art thou, note this carefully, among, not above, among women. When she saw him, she was troubled at his saying, and she cast in her mind what manner of salutation this should be. And the angel said unto her, verse 30, Fear not, Mary, for thou hast found favor with God. And behold, thou shalt conceive in thy womb, and shall bring forth a son. By the way, this is the seed of the woman, Genesis 3. And thou shalt call his name Jehovah Shua, or Joshua is the shortened version, or translated to Greek, Jesus. The name means God, Jehovah Shua, is salvation. God is salvation. You shall call him God is salvation, Jesus. He shall be great and shall be called the son of the highest. What does that mean? In the beginning was the word, and the word was with God, and the word was God, and the word became flesh. He should be called the son of the highest. And the Lord God shall give him the throne of his father David, which means he is the Messiah who will rule and reign. He's the Messiah. And he shall reign over the house of Jacob, how long? Forever. And of his, this is Daniel 9. And of his kingdom there shall be no end. That's what she's told her son that she's going to birth shall do. He is the son of the highest. He shall reign forever. He is the son of David. He is the Messiah. Now, Joseph got a slightly different piece of information. Turn to Matthew 1. Matthew 1. Joseph, as you know, figured out his wife to whom he was espoused was pregnant. This brought him a problem. Again, think of small towns and villages and hamlets, the kind of shame that they would both come under. He was trying to think about what to do with it. He didn't want to make her a public example. Chapter 1, verse 19, Matthew. He was minded to put her away privily, just sort of quietly break it off. And while he thought on these things, verse 20, behold, an angel of the Lord appeared unto him, or the angel of the Lord appeared unto him in a dream, saying, Joseph, thou son of David, fear not to take unto thee Mary thy wife, for that which is conceived in her is of the Holy Spirit. Again, the seed of the woman. And she shall bring forth a son, and thou shalt call his name Jesus. Interesting, they both get the name independently. He gets a different piece of information. For he shall save his people from their sins. That's a little different than what she heard. But then this occurs. When Jesus was born, chapter 2 of Matthew, in Bethlehem of Judea, verse 1, in the days of Herod the king, behold, there came wise men from the east to Jerusalem, saying... Where is he that is born the king of the Jews? For we have seen his star in the east and are come to worship him. When Herod the king had heard these things, verse 3, he was troubled and all Jerusalem with him. And when he had gathered the chief priests and the scribes of the people together, he demanded of them where the Messiah or the Christ should be born. And they said unto him, In Bethlehem of Judea, for thus it is written by the prophet, And thou, Bethlehem, in the land of Judah, art not the least among the princes of Judah, for out of thee shall come a governor that shall rule my people Israel. Then Herod, when he had privily called the wise men, inquired of them diligently what time the star appeared. And he sent them to Bethlehem and said, Go, and search diligently for the young child. And when you have found him, bring me word again that I may come and worship him also. And when they had heard the king, they departed. And lo, the star which they had seen in the east went before them until it, the star, came and stood over where the young child was. Jason Lyle talked about that on Q&A. He's probably right, something unique. And when they saw the star... They rejoiced with exceeding great joy. And when they were come into the house, they saw the young child, again, two-year period, so probably beyond just newly born. They saw the young child with Mary, his mother, and they fell down and worshiped. You're Mary, you have this small baby. These guys show up who are magi. They're, 
the whole thing, right? The outfits and the robes and the people of wealth and they study and they're the, you know, sort of the, the elite, so to speak, in some ways. They're not necessarily the ruling class, but they have the ear of the ruling class and these guys show up and they see you with your child and they begin to bow down and to worship him as the king of the Jews. So you have Joseph hearing that he's going to save their people from their sins You've got Mary being told he will be the son of the highest. He will have the throne of David, his father. His kingdom will have no end. Some short period of time, months after this, perhaps, these guys show up from the far east, most likely the area of Chaldea, Shinar, or Babylon. They show up and they bow down. They begin to worship him as the king of the Jews and then give him three gifts, which you know are gold for deity, frankincense, myrrh, these wonderful gifts. And then they pack up and leave. Was that the only unusual set of occurrences? Was there one more thing that happened? Yeah. What was it? The shepherds. These shepherds show up right as he's born. They find him lying in the manger wrapped in swaddling cloth. And they come and say, we were told to, you know, they told us, what are you doing here? Well, these angels appeared in heaven, busted out with praise. Glory to God in the highest. You know, unto you today, a savior is born, Christ the Lord. And here we are. So the expectation is, he's the Messiah. Is it a correct expectation? Yes, but now let's go back to our text. Well, on your way back, stop at Matthew 20. Why not? Matthew 20. <laughs> Jesus has done many, many miracles at this point. And you'll find also as he you know, deals with Zacchaeus, he's in Jericho, he's heading back to Jerusalem. But as they're about to head up to Jerusalem, in Matthew chapter 20, verse 17, Jesus going up to Jerusalem, and it is uphill, no matter where you come from, to get to Jerusalem. He took the 12 disciples apart in the way, and he said unto them, Behold, we are going up to Jerusalem. What are they anticipating is going to happen? Kingdom now. We are going up to Jerusalem. The Son of Man shall, there's that title again, the one from Daniel's vision. The Son of Man shall be betrayed under the chief priests and unto the scribes. They shall condemn him to death. They shall deliver him to the Gentiles to mock and to scourge and to crucify him. And the third day he shall rise again. And as this is sinking in, James and John, our authors, mother comes and asks that they could have the best seats in the house for eternity future. He was trying to warn them what you're expecting is not what's coming. So then our last hint. Go back to John. And turn slightly past to chapter 13. And then you're going to have a quiz. Oh, I hate when he gives us quizzes. John chapter 13, we'll get there in time. Before the feast of the Passover, this is another one. When Jesus knew that, here's our hint. His hour was come. For what? That he should depart out of this world unto the Father. Having loved his own, which were in the world, he loved them unto the end. Okay, now let's go back and try again this conversation. Jesus was called, chapter 2, verse 2, and his disciples to the marriage, verse 3, and when they wanted wine, which is a real social problem for them on a number of fronts, his mother, the mother of Jesus, saith unto him, they have no wine. What does she expect? He's going to fix it. And Jesus saith unto her, woman, what have I to do with thee? Here's your clue. Mine hour is not yet come. Is he the Messiah? Yes. yes. Will he eventually deliver Israel? Yes. yes. Will he sit on the throne of David, his father? Yes. yes. Is he God in human flesh? Yes. That was chapter one. Yes. So what's going on? Woman, what have I to do with thee? Shh. My hour is not yet come. It's not time for that. You see, first the Christ must suffer. Then he'll enter into his glory. She's going, let's go. Let's do it. You know who you are. Let's do it. Remember, Mary treasured these things up in her heart. This discussion is essentially a very sort of gentle rebuke of God the Father has a timetable, which I am perfectly walking on. It's not time. 
woman, what have I to do with thee? He's not being rude, he's not being harsh, he's not being whatever, he's just correcting the fact that she's got the wrong timing. And you're gonna see this thing of my hour has not yet come throughout John's gospel, it's very important. And he's looking back now with the benefit of time, knowing first that Christ suffers, then comes to glory. She's like, let's have it, let's go, show who you are. Shh, my hour has not yet come. His mother saith unto the servants, notice she didn't get all upset and storm out. Whatsoever he saith unto you, do it. This brings up a very important discussion. Number one, Jesus is born of Mary, clearly indicated to us in the scripture, she is a virgin. Before she was found, before she came together with Joseph, her husband, she was a virgin. That's what caused the whole problem. This fulfills Genesis chapter three, the seed of the woman, because again, a virgin birth. This fulfills Isaiah chapter seven, where it says, the Lord will give you a sign to a wicked king, Ahaz, a virgin, and the word is virgin, a virgin shall be with child. And we will call his name Emmanuel, which is God with us, and it talks about the government should be upon his shoulder. He's the wonderful counselor of the mighty God. So God used Mary, and she's a woman of great faith. If you think about it, when Gabriel came to her and said, fear not Mary, she's already concerned. She is essentially being asked to put herself at risk for being stigmatized, for you know, even potentially being stoned to death as an adulteress, all these things. She was willing to surrender her hopes, her future, her dreams, that she might be useful to the Lord and what he's calling her to. So I don't diminish that by any means. But this is the last time we hear from her in the New Testament. Well, she'll be in the upper room when you've got the 120 gathered and, you know, the 11 disciples. And Peter stands up, says, we're, we're missing one. We need another one. And so they begin to pray and they cast lots. They have two candidates. Matthias gets up, you know, ends up getting the nod. You know, interesting there in the upper room, nobody turned to Mary and said, so who is it? They didn't ask her. The last thing we have recorded from Mary is, whatever Jesus says to you, do it. That's important. Maybe you've come out of a church tradition or church dogma, really, where she is a co-redemptrix or she is a co-redeemer. She's not. She's blessed among women, but not above. She's a woman of incredible faith, but she's not God. She was a vehicle through which God would bring his son. Be very careful. You don't get that out of order. There's only one name given among men whereby we must be saved, Jesus of Nazareth. And that's what your Bible teaches. You may have grown up with a different tradition, but you will not find it substantiated in this book. Be very careful with that. Woman, what have I to do with thee? No, she doesn't understand. Shh. My hour has not yet come. Whose mother saith unto the servants, whatsoever he saith unto you, do it. Clearly, she expects something to happen. And there were there set there six water pots of stone after the manner of the purifying of the Jews, containing two or three firkins apiece, which you're like, <laughs> what's that? it's just under eight and a half gallons, about eight gallons and eight and three eighths gallons. So if you've got two or three of those, you're roughly 20 plus, almost 30 gallons, ultimately. And Jesus saith unto them, fill the water pots with water, and they fill them up to the brim. Why is that important? Why is that important? Because you can't add anything. How many got it? Full of the brim. You can't add anything. You can't just hit it with, you know, like uh, concentrate juice. Fill them to the brim. And he saith unto them, draw out now, and bear unto the governor the feast. And they bear it. And when the ruler of the feast had tasted the water that was made wine and knew, here's another word again, Ido, saw not whence it was, where it came from, but the servants which drew the water, here's our word Ido, they saw or knew, the governor of the feast called the bridegroom and saith unto him, every man at the beginning doth set forth good wine. And when the men have well drunk, as we used to say in Russia, that was, they're trashed. When the men have well drunk, then that which is worse. But thou hast kept the good wine until now. You guys can figure that out. This is the beginning, literally whole arche in the Greek. This is the chief for the beginning of the miracles Jesus did in Cana of Galilee. Just a second. What was the first temptation in the wilderness when fasting for 40 days that Satan hit him with? If you are the son of God, turn these stones into bread. You might say, well... What's the temptation in that? It goes back to the garden. Eat outside of the will of God. 
He was sent there to fast and to be tested. So the first test is where Adam failed, eating outside of the will of God. And the answer was, it is written, man shall not live by bread alone, but by every word that proceedeth out of the mouth of God. So there, he does not turn stones into bread. And of course, he has two other tests. You know how that goes. Here, he has them fill pots with water. And immediately, without touching with anything else, they simply turn into wine. Question, could he have turned the stones into bread? Yeah. yeah. So interesting to keep in mind in light of the other gospels. It turned into wine. So this was the beginning of the miracles. Miracles, semion, that is, and this is plural, which means events that lead to something out of and beyond themselves. In other words, aren't normally possible, often described as revealing the fingerprints of God. This is the beginning of the fingerprints of God being revealed through Jesus. He manifested forth his glory and his disciples believed on him. Verse 12. And after this, he went down to Kafar Nahum. You say it. Kafar. Kafar Nahum. It's a great way to clear the nose, isn't it? Kafar, town of Nahum. You know him as Nahum. It's the town of Nahum. Name the prophet. You're going to need this because when we get to chapter 7, Nicodemus actually tries to take a stand for Jesus. They're judging him without really hearing what he says. And he tries to intervene and they say, search the scriptures. Does any prophet come out of Galilee? Well, where's Capernaum? Galilee, what's Capernaum mean? Kafar Nahum, town of Nahum. Yes. Interesting. John points that out later. They're so upset they forget their own history. He went down to Capernaum, he and his mother and his brethren. Uh, hold it. Brethren, James, Joseph, Simon, and Judas. You can find their names listed in Matthew 13, 55, and 56. And it also tells us, and his sisters. Well, that's easy. See, those are children of, of Joseph's from a prior marriage. Based on? Not this book. Let's review for a minute. Matthew chapter 1, Joseph knew her not until she brought forth her firstborn son, wrapped him up, swaddling clothes. In other words, they remained chaste between each other, even in their betrothal, during the pregnancy she had with Jesus. But after she delivered him, went through the time of purification, Joseph and Mary had a normal marriage relationship that produced four sons and at least two daughters. And you can confirm that, by the way, when you go to Galatians chapter 1, verse 19, because there Paul says, I saw Peter, some of the also other apostles, and he said, and I saw James, the Lord's brother. They're half-brothers. Same mother, but they're of Joseph and Mary. He's been placed in the womb through the power of the Holy Spirit. Now, once again, that may get some of you very upset because you're going to say, well, that's not what we were told. And we were told she's always remained a virgin and all that. And my question to you is, where did you find it in here? You don't. You find that she and Joseph re remained married, had normal marriage relationship, produced four sons, two daughters. That's what the record has, inspired word of God. I believe it's accurate. If that's not what you've been told, then you have to decide, do you want to believe the dogma of the church or men, or do you want to stick with what the scripture says? Yeah, I'm going to get emails tonight. Oh, well. Oh, well. Oh, well. So he went down to Capernaum. He, his mother's mother, and his brethren, and his disciples. And they continued there not many days. And the Jews' Passover was at hand, and Jesus went up to Jerusalem. Remember the Passover, one of three meals where the males are required to attend. All males 20 years old and above, three times a year they have to, to appear before the Lord. Passover, Pentecost was the third, tabernacles. And so here they go up for Passover, beginning of the feast of the ceremonial year. Passover was at hand and Jesus went up to Jerusalem. And he founded the temple, those that sold oxen and sheep and doves. And the changers of the money sitting. Now, how many of you have a Bible? Let me see. Hold it up for a minute. Good. You're now holding the temple complex. Your entire Bible here is called the Hieron, the whole area. Court of the Gentiles, court of the women, court of men. If you have your, your temple, I'll, pay, I'll make it face west for you. If this is your temple here, the little square room, the Holy of Holies, that cube overlaid in gold where the Ark of the Covenant is with the cherubim, that is called the naos in the Greek. 
Hieron, the whole complex, Naos, Holy of Holies. Everybody with me? This is important because when you read 2 Thessalonians 2, the Antichrist, the son of perdition, claims that he's God demanding to be worshipped as God, sitting in the Naos, Holy of Holies, of God. So this entire compound, if you look at your Bible, the left and right side of your Bible where your first columns are, this is the court of the Gentiles. Then you have, as you get about halfway in, this wall that goes along the temple at this time. And it's a short dividing wall, and it's where only Jews may go past. So if you've read the book of Acts, when they grabbed Paul there in the temple and they began to start beating him, their charge was he took a Gentile, they didn't see it, but they assumed it, he took a Gentile past that dividing wall into the area only for Jews, where you then encounter the court of the women and then the court of the men in the actual front porch of the temple. And so their charge was he took a non-Jew past this barrier wall and at the time of the book of Acts they had a sign on it that said anyone who passes this barrier, non-Jew, has only himself to blame for his ensuing death. You pass that, you profaned it, you made it common and the Jews would immediately take you out and stone you and usually the Romans are just kind of whatever, let it happen. It was their religious law. And so here in this temple court, they have set up sheep and goats and oxen, and they had money changers. You might say, well, that's a strange place to do banking. No, see, when you came, especially for Jews, you had to pay your temple tax, half shekel, again, different things over the years, but you had to have that. And so you've got Jews from Persia and Jews from Greece, Hellenized Jews and Jews from Rome. And when you get there, you've got to convert your Roman coins, your Greek coins, your Persian coins into official sanctioned temple coins. Such a deal. You get there and they're like, well, it's going to take this many of your Persian coins to get the temple coin. They're like, what? Are you serious? And they're basically ripping people off as they're wanting to come and worship and give offering to God. And then another problem they have, again, with these doves and these sheep and everything else, all up in this court area, is you, maybe you're close enough, you decide to bring your own livestock with you and you get it there to offer for sacrifice and they go, oh, it has a blemish. Can't offer it. Well, now what do I do? Well, I'll go out and sell it and take the money and buy a pre-approved, pre-certified, 36 months, 3,000 miles guaranteed temple one. I'm not kidding. So they go out and they basically get bargain basement wholesale price for their animal because, of course, it's defiled. They've been told nobody wants it. You know they just took it around, ran it through the car wash and sold it in the temple. I mean, we know this, right? <laughs> so then you go in to go buy the pre-approved temple qualified blameless and you know, blemishless sacrifice and the price is however many times the normal price. So people get there and they're, you know, they've come a long way and they had, they're getting ripped off selling it. Now they've got to buy a new one. They get there like, what? You want how much? Where I come from? There's, and by the way, it's the Middle East. How many have been to a bazaar or shopping center in the Middle East? You haggle for everything. Haggle. And they're very passionate. So this court of the Gentiles, this is where the non-Jews can come and meet the true and living God of the universe. And it was meant to be absolutely open and clear. But there's now this shopping mart going on with these animals and money changers and tables and everything else and haggling and upset and people getting ripped off. It's become this bazaar, for lack of a better word to put, and it's become this shopping place. So the unsaved world, the non-Jewish world, makes the trip to come see what was one of the ancient wonders of the world, this temple, and it's all about money. And it's all about ripping people off who really wanted to come and seek after God. And it was essentially run by and benefiting directly to the chief priests, Annas, Caiaphas, and others. And remember, most of the ruling class are Sadducees. No resurrection. No final judgment. No supernatural. Don't buy into angels. So who cares if they rip off God's people? How many begin to get the picture? So Jesus comes to for this Passover, the temple, and he's been there as a little boy at the age of 12, if you remember. He knows what's going on. But it's reached a point where it's just a complete circus. And so he comes for Passover to the temple. And he found in the temple those that sold oxen and sheep, most likely for a premium, pre-approved. And the changers of money sitting, doing their business. And when he had made a scourge of small cords, <laughs> he's sitting there like, mm -hmm. when he made a scourge of small cords, he drove them, that's literally ek balo, ek out, balo to throw. He threw them out. 
He threw them out, drove them out of the temple. And the sheep and the oxen, opening the pens, driving them out. So now the animals are mayhem. And poured out the changer's money and overthrew the tables. Grabs the tables, flips them. How many have ever done a pinata at a kid's party? I don't know how many pinatas we've had now. Do you know how many times like, whoa, just trying to keep the kids back and the stick flying by. And it's, it's it, anyway, I've gotten better at it. You stand by the mailbox, you over here. What happens when the pinata breaks open? And it's like, right? What happens when you flip a money changer's temple or table in the temple and change goes everywhere? How many got it? It's like, you know, it's like rugby, right? And suddenly everybody's going for it. Flipped over the money changer's tables. This thing becomes absolutely chaos. And, unto, and he said unto them that sold doves, take these things hence, get out. Make not what? My father's house. Who does the temple belong to? Is the temple of God. Who did he just say God is? His father, publicly. Make not my father's house a house of merchandise. The word in the Greek is emporion. What does that sound like? Emporium, a marketplace where commerce occurs. Make thou my house, my father's house, a house of merchandise. And his disciples remembered that it was written, the zeal of thine house hath eaten me up. Okay, we got a, we got a scripture being mentioned, which means, let's go look at it. Psalm 69. Left turn, Psalm 69. The zeal of thine house hath eaten me up. Psalm of David. Save me, O God. For the waters are come in unto my soul. I sink in deep mire where there is no standing. Psalm 69, 2. I am come into deep waters where the floods overflow me. I am weary of my crying. My throat is dried. Mine eyes fail while I wait for my God. They that hate me without a cause are more than the hairs of my head. John will quote that later about Jesus in chapter 15. They that would destroy me being my enemies wrongfully are mighty. Then I restored that which I took not away. O God, thou knowest, verse 5, my foolishness, and my sins are not hid from thee, David interjecting for himself. Let not them that wait on thee, O Lord of hosts, be ashamed for my sake. Let not those that seek thee be confounded for my sake, O God of Israel. Because for thy sake I have borne reproach, boy will he. Shame hath covered my face. We'll see that soon enough. Look at this carefully. I am become a stranger unto my brethren. Did his brothers believe on him? No. That's why when he was on the cross, he looked at John and said, son, behold your mother. Mother, behold your son. He put her in the care of one who truly believed, who followed Christ, rather than in the hands of his four brothers. They didn't yet know the Lord. I am become a stranger unto my brethren. Listen to verse 8 very carefully and an alien unto my mother's children. How many got it? They all share the same mother, but they're from Joseph. For the zeal, look at that, right in context with this verse, for the zeal of thine house hath eaten me up, and the reproaches of them that reproached thee are fallen upon me. When I wept and chastened my soul with fasting, that was to my reproach. I made sackcloth also my garment. I became a proverb to them. They that sit in the gate speak against me, and I was the song of the drunkards. But as for me, my prayer is unto thee, O Lord, in the acceptable time, O God, in the multitude of thy mercy, hear me in the truth of thy salvation. Deliver me out of the mire, and let me not sink. Let me be delivered from them that hate me, and out of the deep waters. Let not the water flood overflow me, neither let the deep swallow me up. Let not the pit shut her mouth upon me. Hear, O Lord, for thy loving kindness is good. Turn unto me according to the multitude of thy tender mercies. Hide not thy face from thy servant. What did he cry? Why have you forsaken me? For I am in trouble. Hear me speedily. Draw nigh unto my soul and redeem it. Deliver me because of mine enemies. Thou hast known my reproach and my shame and my dishonor. My adversaries are all before thee. Reproach hath broken my heart. I am full of heaviness, and I looked for some to take pity, but there was none, and for comforters, but I found none. Well, how do you know this applies to Jesus? Next verse. They gave me gall for my meat 
And in my thirst, they gave me vinegar to drink. We'll see that soon enough. Let their table, that is a blessing. Let their table or their blessing become a snare before them. And that which should have been for their welfare, let it become a trap. The Jews rejecting him now stumble at his name. Let their eyes be darkened that they see not and make their loins continually to shake. Pour out thine indignation upon them and let thy wrathful anger take hold of them. Let their habitation be desolate. Let none dwell in their tents. For they persecute him whom thou hast smitten. The Lord wounded him for our transgressions. And they talk to the grief of those whom thou hast wounded. Add iniquity unto their iniquity. Let them not come into thy righteousness. Woe, let them be blotted out of the book of the living and not be written with the righteous. But I am poor and sorrowful. Let thy salvation, O God, set me up on high. I will praise the name of God with a song and will magnify him with thanksgiving. This also shall please the Lord better than an ox or bullock that hath horns or hoofs, a better sacrifice. The humble shall see this and be glad, and your heart shall live that seek God, eternal life. That's next week's chapter. For the Lord heareth the poor and despiseth not his prisoners. Let the heaven and the earth praise him, the seas and everything that moveth therein. For God will save Zion and will build the cities of Judah, that they may dwell there and have, him, have it in possession. The seed also of his servants shall inherit it, and they that love his name shall dwell therein. Great psalm. So here we are, Jesus, seeing what's going on, the crazy circus happening where the Gentiles are to come and worship the Lord, and he drives them out. One more thing you should know. Herod, those, how many were with us in Malachi? Two of you. I knew Don would. Herod, what is his background? He is an Idumean, which means Edomite, part Edomite, part Jewish, married in, so to speak. So he's not fully Jewish, which means he can't go past that wall. And that really fried Herod. So what he did is, if this is again your temple and here's your temple, temple mount and here's your temple right here, he built on the northwestern side the Fortress Antonia, that four-towered structure. How many have seen it in pictures and all that? If not, go walk around the hallways. And when he built those four towers, the one that was closest toward the Holy of Holies, he built the highest according to tradition so he could look down inside there, the court of the men, and inside the temple area where the sacrifices were offered. So he basically created a perch so he could see what he was excluded from, which really got the Jews upset. This is also why, as this whole structure lays out, when they're trying to kill Paul, the Romans come down so quickly because they're right next to it and they can see everything happening. But that's all side. So, his disciples remembered, verse 17, that it was written, the zeal of thine house hath eaten me up, Psalm 69, clearly messianic, many things about Jesus. So then answered the Jews, as he was driving them all out with a cord of whip, How many understand righteous anger? Not many hands. How many know unrighteous anger? It's called traffic, right? Road rage, whatever. Here's a righteous anger. People are trying to come and seek God. And rather than find the Lord, they're finding just an absolute scam, taking advantage of them. What seems to be happening more and more among personalities in the Christian movement, you know, evangelical Christianity, are people who really are very much about appearance, very much about what they're doing, very much about what they can raise up for money. And, you know, it's really kind of sad because the unsaved world, most times their first interaction with trying to find anything about the gospel is tuning on to some kind of cable channel or whatever it may be. And here they see many ministries that are really all simply about how much money they can get out of you. You give this certain offering, we'll give you this book. You give this, we'll give you a prayer cloth. You go, and they go through all these things. And for the unsaved world, they see this like they just want my cash. Instead of God wants a relationship with you. It's a sad thing. They said, what sign? The Jews answered Jesus and said unto him, what sign showest thou unto us, seeing that thou doest these things? Remember, the Greeks seek after wisdom. The Jews look for signs. They want a miracle. And remember, he just cleared an entire temple, Mount Complex, got rid of all the animals, all the money changers. Nobody challenged him. I would personally call that a miracle. And please understand, if you've got European artwork in your mind, you know, sort of the, the long-haired, effeminate Jesus of the Renaissance and everything else, this is a guy whose father was 
father, quote, quote, air quotes, father was a carpenter and a stonemason, most likely. They work with their hands. They do all their drilling with the kind of, it looks like a bow with a metal point on a stick of wood. Their hand saws, it's all hand labor. This is a guy who had a grip and who had hands. And when he got a hold of that cord of whip, they were, they cleared it, everybody out, like a bad party getting raided. They're all gone. Not that I would know anything about that, but they were all gone. <laughs> And they say, well, what sign will you show seeing you've done these things? He just did one. But anyway, Jesus answered and said unto them, destroy, break down, destroy this naos. What's the naos? The little square room where the glory of God is hidden behind a veil. Who is he? God in the veil of human flesh. Destroy this naos and I will raise it up, interesting word, Ijirio, to rise, to have risen, to rise from sleep or from lying down. Destroy this temple and in three days I will raise it up. Then said the Jews, whoa, 40 and six years was this temple in building. Herod started the project to beautify the second temple that was of Zerubbabel to ingratiate himself to the Jews because they all knew he's not fully Jewish. So he did a beautification project hoping to accept favor you know, sort of like putting out projects in your own constituents, make them love you. And so for 46 years, they've been doing this. And they finished it seven years before it was destroyed. 63 AD. It had seven short years and then ripped down to pieces. Forty and six years is this temple in building. And will thou rear it up in three days? John, with the benefit of hindsight, gets it. But he spake of the temple of his body. When therefore he was risen from the dead, the same word again, Ejirio, when he was therefore risen from the dead, his disciples remembered that he had said this unto them. And they believed the scripture and the word which Jesus had said. Now when he was in Jerusalem at the Passover, in the feast day, many believed in his name. When they saw the miracles, the reo, to sit like a spectator, when they saw the miracles which he did, but Jesus did not commit himself unto them because he knew all, literally gnosko pos, knew all. The context is men, but it's a pregnant statement. He knew all, omniscient. And he needed not that any should testify of man, for he knew what was in man. So he comes to town, first major feast with his disciples, goes right into the temple, gives notice to the religious leadership that they are being basically rebuked, you know, that was a bunch of meetings with a bunch of robes trying to figure out what are we going to do with this guy. And if we let this go on, someone else is going to try it. And he's giving notice to the nation, which is bound to gain some attention by very important people. But that's next week's chapter. We're out of time. Let's stand. Let's pray. There's only one person in human history who fulfills some 300 prophecies. I think we saw, what, seven or eight at least in Psalm 69 alone? There's only one person who's ever died, risen again the third day, as prophesied, as promised, and offers to anyone who will receive him eternal life, and that is Jesus of Nazareth. I'm guessing most of you coming out on Wednesday night, usually you're like, yeah, we get it. Make sure you don't know about Jesus. Make sure you know Jesus. Make sure you're not just churched. Make sure, as we'll learn again next week, you've been truly born again when you open your heart and you trust Christ as your Savior. He will come in, he will change you, he will give you eternal life. You can't just know about him. You've got to make him your own. Father, we thank you for this day. Thank you for your word. Thank you for John's gospel. So many things he was trying to tell us with hindsight. And Lord, I pray for anyone here, perhaps some of the things shared tonight from your word is not what they were taught as they were raising up or growing up within a church and they're struggling. Lord, I pray that they would take the time to study these things for themselves. Matthew 1, Luke 1, 2, 3, Matthew 13, 55, Galatians 1, 17. They would take the time to read for themselves and realize your word is true and there's only one redeemer, one mediator between God and man and that is the man Christ Jesus. Thank you, Lord, for coming for us. Thank you for paying for our sins. And again, thank you for this great gospel, Lord. The things that John shares with us, may they change how we live. 
And Lord, how I pray for your church in these last days because Lord, honestly, when people turn on the tube, it's, it's fog machines and routines and all kinds of other things. And they're falling so far away from sticking to your word, speaking the truth in love, equipping the saints and calling sinners to repent of actual sin. And so I pray, Lord, you'd bring a revival that your church would see its sin as you see it. And it would cause them, Lord, to turn and get right with you, that their walk would change, the peace of God would come, the power of God would come as they walk in simple obedience. And that would get the attention of the lost and there would come an awakening. Lord, how we pray for our nation, it needs a fresh work of God. May we have a third great awakening, we pray in Jesus' name, amen.